So, for tonight's message, I was given just a couple of little abstract things because it's supposed to be another one of the more topical studies than necessarily Bible study. Um, <clears throat> one of them was Galatians 1.12, which is simply Paul addressing the church and saying, I did not receive it from man, from any man, nor was I taught it, rather I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ, talking about the gospel which he preached. And then the other little snippet was from Galatians 3.12, <coughs> which says, the law, is ba- the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. And even just to go back to 11 and give a little bit more context to what he's saying, clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. <coughs> so, what I was getting on it, even in what to talk about regarding this, this message, and in particular this discussion about revelation, as it were, and specifically receiving revelation from God, specifically receiving revelation and even functioning in that place. One of the great troubles that we run into, and this kind of, in some ways, this actually kind of branches off of last week, I guess, and what was kind of brought up at the end of last week with the discussions about giving and the heart of a giver and so on is that we oftentimes find ourselves bumping into these two issues where we have the law and then we have revelation. And see, one thing to understand is about, as it pertains to the law, and for purposes of speech, when I refer to the law, um, in a lot of ways I am referring to the Bible, just period. Even including the, the later, the epistles and so on. And the reason why I'm lumping that all together specifically correlates to the fact that the way that a lot of Christians perceive the Bible is as a collection of rules. The way that we perceive it, the way that we function in it, even more so, is as a collection of rules. And the thing that this robs us of is even the intention behind it. A lot of Christians, you know, are prone to going back to the epistles, they like to read Paul's writings because Paul's writings are pretty straightforward. Do this, don't do that. Don't do these things. Be this kind of person. Be be a cheerful giver. Don't get drunk at communion. Things like that. And the problem with it is is that that belies the heart of what Paul was writing because in in many cases he was addressing specific issues in churches but also behind it all was Paul's desire to usher in a place of holiness in the church not necessarily to say this is for all believers to do these things all the time but simply to say this is what the kingdom of God looks like Much the same, his words and his directives were a little bit more specific than what Jesus said when he gave the various parables. And in the parables, Jesus always said, this is is what the kingdom of God looks like, as an attempt to express what it looked like to be under the reign of God. The problem with it is, is that, sorry, I got a thing in my throat. Everybody's been doing that all day. Yeah. <laughs> so, the thing of it is, is even in this place of talking about recept- revelation, is that we have to understand that even the epistles and these particular p- parts of the Bible that we're talking about, the New Testament was all revelation. This was all stuff that was pre that was given 
out of revelation. The stuff that Jesus taught was revelation. The stuff that Paul taught most often was revelation. He'd, I, he received these letters and he responded. And even a lot of what he shared in those letters pertaining to the people and pertaining to the situations was revelation that he was given. And see, there's a place for that in the church that doesn't really, that isn't really fulfilled a whole lot these days. The reality of it is that in many ways what we, where we often sit is in a consistent place of looking back to what rules to follow in order to justify ourselves, in order to make ourselves look good. We talked a little bit about this in the people-pleasing thing, and in particular the message about, about trying to please God. But there is a bit of overlap here, and we're going to go back over that to some extent. Because even where Paul talks about it in this chunk of Galatians, saying that <clears throat> the law is not based on faith and the man who does these things will live by them. He's addressing the fact that in many ways, when we look at something in terms of law, in terms of we take it into a place of being right and wrong, and in so many ways this is what we do with the Bible, which again is why, for purposes of speech, I'll end up referring to the Bible as the law so often throughout the course of this is just to bring back to fa back this term, this reality that for many of us this is the way we look at it. <coughs> we live by these things, we live by these rules, and more than that, we justify ourselves and validate ourselves per by them. We look at these things and say, "This is what makes me good." If I'm doing these things, if I'm following these rules, I am good. It doesn't matter where our hearts are. You can be the most morally corrupt, like morally bankrupt, critical, cruel person. But hey, as long as you're reading your Bible, as long as you're saying prayers every night, as long as you believe in Jesus, as long as you are giving sometimes, somewhere, somebody, <clears throat> as long as you are being happy or being joyful, looking joyful, then, you know, you're good. You are a righteous man or a woman in those circumstances. But see, Paul says something very, very clear there with that point about the law is not based on faith. Because at the end of the day, it removes, when we turn it into a collection of rules and remove the heart behind all of it, and even to go further, just to even address that point with the Old Testament, a lot of the Old Testament and the law in it itself was missing the point then too. If you look at what the law says and what the rules are, so to speak, and then you go to like the first chapter of Isaiah, I mean, the how much of Leviticus is devoted to describing how to perform sacrifices to God? <coughs> like the blood sacrifices and so on that were supposed to happen. And these were the things that were supposed to make people righteous. And then the first chapter of Isaiah is God literally saying, I'm sick of your sacrifices. I don't want them anymore. They don't mean anything. Because see, what, um, even with the Old Testament, and now with the New Testament as well, with the Bible as a whole, when we take it to a place of making it about sheerly about the rules, we remove God from the situation. We're no longer culpable to the Holy Spirit, but instead we're culpable to what we, as people, are capable of doing or not doing. That is where we, did, where we dictate our value, where we find it, where we generate it, and where we maintain it, where we hold it up in front of other people to tell them why we're good enough. As opposed to living in faith, living in the faith of, and the revelation of knowing that we are sons and, <clears throat> sons and daughters of God, knowing that we're already good enough, knowing that we've been chosen, that we've been made, that we've been, that we've been sacrificed for. There's a real place for this 
to look at this and to understand this. Because we've talked before about how in so many ways we we aren't defined by the things that we do so much as we're defined by the who by who we are. The thing of it is is that a a really bad person, a lot of really bad people get by in the world looking like good people by doing good things, even though their intentions are corrupt. I can speak for myself from my experience when I was at my worst. When I was, uh, when I was in the midst of like spending time uh, talking to demons and going out to people and robbing them of their faith, I was viewed as a stoic, moral, and even Christian man. Because what I projected myself as being were those things. I acted this role. I served this, I, I made people believe I was this thing. I didn't know the Bible well, but I knew enough to work around high my fellow high schoolers. And therein lies the thing that I looked good. I helped people believe that I was good, but at my core, I was anything but. Whereas the reality of it is with, with us and the way that we are to live with God, there is a place for us to be good and to recognize that we are good and to live as though we are good. And that's not to say we, put, we say, well, I'm going to do these things and make myself look good. No, it's simply to take away from that even, to say, look, you're a good person. You've been saved. You've been saved and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Just live in that. It's an interesting thing because in many ways it's very counter to what a lot of to what a lot of people function in, just in general, in society and in Christianity at large. Because in so many ways, the way that we do this is like, well, okay, you've been saved by grace, grace covers you, now, go live under grace. What that looks like is doing all the things in this book. So follow all these rules and you're living under grace. But the reality of it is, is that it doesn't go that far. It simply ends at live under grace. See, we have to function in a way where we're living under the faith that we are who God says we are. Yeah, the Bible's not an exhaustive rule book. It's there with enough foundational principles, but you gotta you gotta have a spirit and grace to kind of rip off of that and spontaneously like be led in in things that it wasn't written to address. Right. That's true. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but. But yeah, there's lots of places where even in the New Testament, like it's just laying down the law mm -hmm. for people that needed it because they were intentionally being insubordinate and stuff. Right. In many ways, the Bible can be looked at to an extent, and I won't push this too far, but as a guideline to help us see what righteousness looks like and what unrighteousness looks like. If we make it about, well, this is what you have to do in order to be this, then it becomes loss. However, when we look at it from the perspective of, well, when we talk about joy as an example, and what it looks like to be a joyful person, we can see examples of joyful people in the scriptures. We can see examples of faithful people, righteous people, good people. And the thing is, is that none of them are ever perfect. <clears throat> Even like John the Baptist, for example, Yeah. who was considered one of the most righteous men in all the Bible, per Jesus' words. There is no man more blessed than John. Yet at the same time, there's a portion of the scriptures where John send, John's in prison, and he sends some of his followers to go ask Jesus if he's actually Jesus. And this is after he had already baptized him and proclaim him the Messiah after they had that that moment where the the sun came down and the Holy 
and the Spirit descended like a dove onto Jesus. After having that moment, after be, having that be so clear, there was still a point where later on John the Baptist was just like, are you sure you're the Messiah? Are you, are you really Jesus? His faith wasn't secure in that. And I say all that just to, spec- just to drive home this point that these were righteous men. John the Baptist was a very righteous man. It was after his death when Jesus eulogizes him and explains that there was no one like him. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the flub-ups, it's about the relationship. And that's something that's revelatory. That's something that we receive in such a way. It's not something that we take. We don't make ourselves righteous. Even to even even to further drive home that point, one thing that I was mentioning to a word that I got for Heather last night when I was talking to her was have you ever noticed that in the Bible there were two people sleeping in the bottom of a ship during the storms? One was Jesus and the other was Jonah. We all are familiar with the story of Jesus being asleep during the storm in the boat. The boat's rocking, the, dis- the disciples are panicking, Jesus, comes up, uh, Jesus is asleep in the bottom, and he comes up, calms the storm, and goes back to bed. However, what we miss is that in Jonah, Jonah is actually going through the same thing. Jonah, who was not obedient, He was literally running from God at this point in time because he was refusing to go to Nineveh and share the message that he was given by God to to deliver because he wanted them to suffer. He wanted the Ninevites to suffer terribly and he didn't want God's mercy for them. So he ran away, stowed away in this boat, and when the storms came, he was sleeping. Because at the end of the day, both of them understood this one thing, that they're safe. And that they have, their relationship with God was so strong that they knew they were safe. Jonah, despite his disobedience, knew he was safe. He had a relationship with God that was so strong and so clear that he didn't need to prove it. He didn't need to, he didn't need to prove that he was good enough. He knew. He didn't need to prove himself in order to believe that he had God's providence. He knew he had it. You could argue he was abusing it to an extent, but at the end of the day, for purposes of this message and purposes of the point that's being, that I'm being trying to relay, or trying to be relayed, it's that that doesn't matter. What matters is the level of relationship that was there, the level of trust that was there, the level of belief that was there in both cases. Also, wasn't there also an incident of Paul being asleep in a boat or something like that? I was thinking about that, but I don't think so. Okay. I think he was awake when the storm hit in the next. Okay. I'll have to go double check later. So one of the big things here is that, so even just to explain one thing further and to go a little deeper into it, talking about the point that the the law is not based on faith, there's a significant portion of that that actually where, where we live based off of law, that it will completely rob us of the ability to even grow in our faith. Because at the end of the day, our relationship with God will only ever go as far as we can make it go. And that's not a relationship. Not really. See, if you think about it in your best friendships, or your best relationships, or whatever you've had, how many of those were created because you pursued, and you fought, and you made it happen? At the end of the day, a strong friendship, a strong relationship of any kind only exists when both parties involved are partisan to it. 
you can't be the only one fighting for it while they walk away. You can't be the only one, you can't make it happen. All you'll end up doing is deluding yourself. And there's a thing where the truth to this, relating to the scriptures, is that when it's about the law, it's purely about our ability to make us ourselves righteous, or at least make ourselves look righteous. However, when it stands in that place of revelation that Paul references, the gospel that he received from Jesus Christ and was then able to go out and minister, preach in Arabia, that was something real. That was something life-changing. Because suddenly it wasn't about just him, but it was about him and God and functioning together, and moving together, and growing together as he came to know more of who God was and God revealed more of himself. There's this, there's this part of it where the revelation that we receive, the revelation that we receive as we walk with God is something that is mutually, or it builds us up mutually. God's able to trust us with more and show us more and bring us to more and draw closer to us and we're able to receive that. We're able to be more, to do more, to recognize more of who we are, to live in a greater sense of freedom as we function in this way that our faith grows in Him and as such our lives are further and further enriched by that faith. Even this tough point about knowing who we are, about knowing that we're sons and daughters of God, there's a big portion of that that has to come purely from the revelation of God. We can't, we can read the Bible and see where that's true. You can read like Revelation 3.21, and you can read Jesus talking about, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. But that doesn't make it real. What makes it real is when you feel the Holy Spirit and the presence of God, and he reveals what that really means and how true his love for you is, how true his presence is in your life, how real it is that he's there with you in every single day and every moment. And then as you walk in that and live in that. And I keep saying this point about walking in it and living in it, but all that literally means is just that. It's very simple. That doesn't mean grabbing onto it. That simply means not fighting it. When we get up in the morning, we don't fight to breathe. We don't fight to eat. You just do it unconsciously. You breathe, yeah. You go out and you get food when you're hungry. You get water when you're thirsty. Well, like, unless you're meditating and you're intentionally dwelling on it for some reason. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is, is that if you're meditating, you're not living. You're just doing a thing. Yeah. This, this faith, this living in this place of revelation... This is something that's not done by any active thing. It's simply by accepting what's true and living in that. Mm -hmm. We accept that we need air, so we breathe. Even if you try not to, you'll just pass out and start breathing again. There's a place for us to receive the gospel in such a way. Like faith is supposed to be just like a knowing that you don't. It's not like a, a struggle to try and hold on to it. Right. And I think, and, and I personally believe that, even to just like step aside from the message for a moment, but I personally believe that this is something that's so incredibly important to us as Christians in general to be able to live in this place of just receiving the truth of who God is yeah, I receive that I have known it. and to even receive it instead of working for it there are a lot of ways where 
you know, I, I personally spent so many years trying to manufacture a relationship with God. I tried to be the best Christian that I could be. I wanted to be a shining example. And in a lot of ways, I was overcompensating for my past and, like, where I'd been. I'd been the very worst. And in many ways, I wanted to try to, like, grab hold of this and say, well, now I'm going to be the very best. <coughs> At the end of the day, you know, I couldn't really do that. I was, on the one hand, I was doing all these righteous things, but I was also like a bitter asshole and just completely tearing down the people around me. I forgot, did you used to be like gothic? No, no, no. Oh, not, not really. Sure. Not on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> not on the outside. I was like a... a well, Oh, God. I'm not even going to get into Jeremy the doctor of some photos of him. <laughs> yeah. I just want to see that vampire or, or white face. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it runs in the family. His brother could write some really deep poetry. It's very dark. Like Nightmare Before Christmas stuff. Huh? That was intense. We don't talk about Matt's poetry. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> Matt tried. <laughs> He tried, dang it. <laughs> anyway, um, but so in this place, like, I was doing, I looked good for people. Even in this place where I was a Christian, I was still trying to make myself look good. I was still grabbing onto the Bible and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And that's the thing where it's like, you can't, you can't make that happen. So just so you guys know, like, we're in the wrapper now, but these are, like, all the rooms that you're in. These are all the other rooms. Oh, this is where you stay, like, these are all the rooms. It's all the rooms. Right? Anyway. Oh, yeah. And then they got different, like, areas to sit and drink and eat, right? Hang out. This is a, this is a good spot for I like houses. that guy. Hey, Jack, you missed it, because the guy that got in front of us, he was like, hey, uh, I can stay this night in the wrapper now. And I was like, yeah, but I'll probably be with you. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> I'll let the more, more boisterous ones pass. Um, anyway, but as I was saying, like, holding up the Bible and saying, I'm going to do this, that was delusional. There was no part of me that could make that happen without God, and that in many ways I had to learn that the hard way. And I think it's important for us to even understand that as Christians, not only to understand that, but to even be able to share that with people around us to say, look, you can't make all these things happen. This isn't a book of rules for you to follow. It'll help you, but at the same time, you have to recognize that what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to have a relationship with Jesus. You're going to have to have such a place where he can reveal to you, where he can make you whole, and he can build into you these things. Because in many ways, we don't, we don't really receive the idea that God can change our hearts. We think that in a lot of ways that people are what they are. We don't look at the realities of who we are and where we've been and how that affects us. Often, especially when we think that we've had some form of healing of it, we want to hold on to the idea that we're okay now because I let this go this one time. And oftentimes that can blind us to the realities of exactly how much that thing is still affecting us. I, I prayed for my depression and I believe it was taken away even though my very essence in life is just devoted to being under this dark cloud of despair that I live in, I still want to believe that, so I'm going to hold on to that and fight anybody that tells me otherwise. This is a thing that happens all the time. So more than that, there's a thing for us to receive the revelation of Jesus Christ and who he is, but also the whole, but more than that, the Holy Spirit and the counselor that that is that oh, brings Thomas light to those places. And not only brings light to those places, but brings healing to those places. God doesn't expose things just for the fun of saying, oh, look at that, that's funny. Huh? No, he exposes them for a purpose. That is to bring healing. That is to bring change. God is fully capable of changing our hearts. He's fully capable of changing who we are as people. And in a lot of ways, that does come simply from recognizing 
that were his, were his kids. To drop our parents by the, by the wayside, to drop our friends, to drop our past, to drop all these different things that we cling on to, to say, this is the quantum of my identity, and to simply let God reveal to us what our identity really is, to reveal to us who we really are. To let him strip away all those little, all those layers of different idols and delusions. And to let him say, this is you. And then to live in that, as opposed to trying to hold up those old things. And that can be scary. I've seen people go through the struggles of just like, having their identity be taken away from them because they were so built up in who they thought they were. And then suddenly they're, they're finding out that's not true. They, don't, they look in the mirror and they don't recognize themselves anymore. I've gone through that. I know Jeremy's gone through that. What was the name you were going to go with? Rockdar? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a real thing with that too where when Jesus grabbed each disciple, he gave them a new name. Well, not all of them, but with Peter, or he grabbed, or I don't remember what Peter's original name was, but he called him Cephas. It's like, you're going to be my rock. Cephas is the Hebrew version of Peter or something like that. Right. Yeah. With Paul, who was originally Saul of Tarsus, there's a real thing to that, just being given these new names. With when God grabbed Abram, he became Abraham. Sometimes we have to receive that new identity, and sometimes it does take something so incredibly substantial and clear to even be able to accept and live in that as a whole new name, a whole new person. Back to the point at hand. So in talking about revelation and even receiving revelation. Oh yeah, and, and Peter's original name was Simon. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't remember it, but it was Simon. I was trying to think of what his name was. I was like, what was it? Why do you have a different name? Because, and Cephas and, and Peter are just the Greek and Hebrew synonymous. Oh, yeah. okay. I I just didn't read that part before. But it's not about reading it. Oh. I literally just explained it. Oh. I... It was like, God, when Jesus came to Simon, he gave him a new name, which was Peter. Oh, said, okay. Sorry, said, I missed that. Yeah. Simon Bar Jonah, like which means son of Jonah or something like that. And he says, uh, like I'm giving you this new name, Peter. Mm-hmm. Cephas. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the point. It's like sometimes we have to we do have to receive a new identity and even it in such a significant way. So again, back to the subject of revelation specifically. See, the thing of it is, is that although we talk about the law and about even using the Bible as an example of law and how in many ways it's treated like that, when it comes to receiving revelation, there are a lot of different ways in which God can do that for us. And like, we were talking about at the river, how there are a lot of different ways. And like, for some of us, we have the gift of prophecy and God does reveal just straight up. He will talk straight to the person whether that's through, like, I hear an audible voice. Other people I know hear an audible voice. But then other people, like Dusty, for example, she sees visions, has dreams. Um, Jeremy sees visions. Other people, it's like a, probably the most common one is a strong, what, what's referred to as an impression which is that they just feel this strong, intuitive drive, and you know it's coming from something outside of yourself. 
because it's stronger than that. It's not just that gut feeling that intuition typically is, but it's something even deeper than that. It's like it just pierces your heart and your stomach and your mind, and you have to do this. It's compulsory, almost. So you're driven to go do this thing. And that's one way in which God tends to like work with people. But there are other ways as well. When I was in my early days as a Christian, many, you know, God would use the Bible. Like that's a, an easy one. Drawn to that one specific verse, even just opening up it up. And that one thing that you read that just hits you over the head and you feel that kind of eureka moment. Sometimes it's through a song, sometimes it's through a sermon. Sometimes it's even just through a billboard or something like that, where it just hits you. The truth of the matter is, is that we, we perhaps neglect the idea of how capable God is of speaking to us and revealing his will to us. And there are way too many people who get, get off on the subject about, well, I just have peace about this. I would argue that that's actually more destructive than constructive to go with the idea of feeling peace on something. At my worst, I felt peace on doing really terrible things because I believed I was justified. So in many ways, I think that it needs to come from outside of us. And that's an important thing as well because when we look at the Bible even, to look at the stories of the scriptures, or in the scriptures, Paul didn't just feel a peace about something. He got knocked off of his horse, and Jesus told him who he was and what he wanted. Moses didn't just have a peace. He saw a burning bush, and it spoke to him. And that was God speaking to him. There's a thing where we're willing to compromise in order to try to get close to God instead of letting God get close to us and even hit us at those places to reach us. And in that place we can rob ourselves of the a true experience with the divine. And ultimately we can easily just fall into places of trying to control things. Because that's the really difficult place with all of this. Is that in many ways the great struggle with anybody, especially from prophets to people who want to be prophets to people who are not prophets in any way, shape, or form, but really want anything. We can easily move into places where we, you know, we manipulate whatever is being shared with us in order to try to make it what we want. And there's a caution there, and there's a place for us to even step back out of ourselves and let God minister to that, and to be very careful about where our hearts are at. And you know, if you're not the kind of person who hears God directly, but you have to rely on those signs, and there's even just a greater place to be patient and to wait for him to show you who he is and what he wants from you. But even more than that, there's a place to not get caught up on what you need to be doing so much as who you need to be. One of the strongest, one of the most consistent things that I've run into in my time developing and fostering a relationship with God has been that so often the things that I want direction on are directly related to the things that I need to grow into as a person. And what I mean by that is so many times when I had something that I, I asked God about, saying, hey, can you tell me what to do here? Instead, what he would want to do is talk to me about my heart and about what kind of a person I was or what kind of a person I am, as opposed to what I was thinking about. And once, and oftentimes, once he did address that, the answer to that problem became painfully clear. Because it wasn't about, it wasn't about what to do. It was about who I was in the situation. 
or who I needed to be. And that removed a lot of the struggle, that removes a lot of the strife. Because see, the thing of it is, is at the end of the day, when we have clarity in who we are, when we're mature in our identities, we're also mature in our relationship with God. If I know who I am and know that I am a son of God, I also know God well enough to know what that means. And as such, we fall back to like uh, Ephesians 4, which we'll go look at that really fast because it does pertain. People can forget some things and become blind and be reminded. Mm-hmm. All right. This particular passage. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Even it, even with that statement about the teachings of, and cunning and craftiness of men, that can be just as much the individual themselves as the people around them. So there's a place for us to even receive what's being revealed to us and even hunger and thirst for revelation because that's the kind of thing that can drive us in such a way, that can move us, that can free us from that kind of place. Because if we're real about it, that's where a lot of us sit. A lot of us are looking for answers more than we're comfortable, more than we're safe. A lot of us are trying to go out and find what we need to do <coughs> instead, of re instead of knowing who we are. There's not a lot of safety for us in this place where we're, we don't know who we are, we don't know what we're supposed to be doing, we don't understand all these things. We haven't, that hasn't been revealed to us because what's intended to be revealed to us is who we are. And the truth of the matter is, is if God has some incredible calling on your life, let's say that God's calling you out to be a missionary and you know that that's what he wants you to do and you know that's who he wants you to be, He's not going to send you out to do it if you're not ready to do it. Because at the end of the day, if you're so twisted up in who you think you're supposed to be in order to go do that, and that ha does not have anything to do, that person, that identity, does not have anything to do with who he has made you to be, then all you will do is reap destruction. You'll go out into another nation full of people who don't know God and he'll show them some twisted, contorted version of a Christian that breaks them. <coughs> when, uh, when Columbus first landed in the Caribbean, you know, he brought, he brought the, he brought Christianity with him. And I remember a particular tale in which they were burning at the stake a number of the Carib Indians. And the Caribs, they had the priest go up to the Caribs and ask them, you know, do you want to convert to be saved from the fires of hell? And they told them no. The Carib Indians said no, we don't want to go to heaven if there are more white people there. And then they were burned at the stake and they died. They said they didn't want to go to heaven if white people were going to be there? They didn't want to go to heaven if it meant there would be more Christians, more white people there. Oh, okay. They would rather go to hell. Yeah. They would rather spend an eternity suffering than be with God. Or maybe it's just their witty way of saying, like, your Inquisition BS is going to dignify anything you're saying. In the context of the story, no. I've read it. Yeah. 
But that's the thing of it, just to paint a very clear picture of what this can look like and how destructive we can be, even when we're claiming to represent Jesus, especially when we're claiming to represent Jesus. So there is a place for us to step back and let God reveal who he is and reveal who we are. And even hung to hunger and thirst to want that. And that's where, in so many ways, we'll find freedom, we'll find clarity, we'll find direction, we'll find safety, and we'll find peace. Right there with him, living in faith instead of following law. And that's all I got. <laughs>